Thanks for coming to uh, the Road Trip Nation panel. Uh, my name is Mike Werner. I'm co-founder of Road Trip Nation, and uh, we're here to share with you uh, some footage in a trailer from one of the most powerful road trips we've ever produced for Road Trip Nation, focused on justice impacted individuals. Um, a, a few years ago, we started to work uh, on then with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, now the Just Trust, um, and also the Stand Together Initiative. Uh, we had a, a group of three justice impacted individuals who went across America and interviewed other justice in, in, impacted individuals across the country um, who had successfully transitioned to meaningful employment pathways to learn about their personal journeys and the steps they've taken to where they are today. Um, that show has been broadcasting on PBS stations all across the country in over 60 million households for the past six months. Um, and now we're learning, we've done some research. Road Trip Nation is part of a larger nonprofit network called the Strata Education Foundation that Tom Dawson here, who's the president of Strata Collaborative, um, leads up. And so Strata funded a research study on the, per the perception and mindset shifts of HR frontline employer and recruiters done by the Sherman Institute, which I'll let Tom and the panel talk about in a second here, um, which we're going to talk about here today. But I'll, I'll let I'll let Tom tee the whole thing up. But for now, we'll play the uh, trailer from from Being Free, and uh, we'll take it take it from there. So, thanks. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Um, I can't tell you where I'm going to be at in five years. It's five years ago. I was in prison. Ask me what I'm doing, just grinding. Is what I hate, let them hate, never the anxiety mind. about being released back into the streets is there. Like, am I good enough? Am I going to make it? Reintegrating back into society, unfortunately, it's not that easy. It's a little traumatizing after being pulled away from it so long. Where am I going to live? Where am I going to work? That was my prison ID. That's what I was known for for the last 18 and a half years while I was in there. There is no way that I could just rewind and somehow, some way, make everything better again. The option that I'm left with is starting today, being in the moment, being present. So we are formerly incarcerated individuals going around the southern region of the U.S. interviewing folks who have been affected or are affecting a formerly incarcerated population. Media has placed this stigma on us that people inside prison, they're thugs, they're uneducated, all these misconceptions. So maybe just bringing awareness to that. It's such a hard thing to do, to do time in prison, right? It's easy to become discouraged. There were moments when I thought maybe I would never get out of prison. Folks in prison are telling you that your life is over, that you're never gonna be anything. Don't believe any of that. I felt like I was wrong with all that time because I had a 33 year sentence for five ounces of marijuana. But you could either get bitter or better. We know that our legislation is outdated and we just know that more has to be done. It won't just come if we're mad about it, it won't just come if we're hopeful about it. We gotta be intentional and deliberate. Because we can sit here and reimagine how we want community to be, how we want the world to be, but in order for that to happen, we got to be that change because we want to keep our people out of these systems. What are we going to do to turn this pain into purpose? Like to put them down so we can really get the full effect. I don't really do the selfies, bro. There's many individuals that I've met that are still in prison that also deserve to be here with me. I feel the warmth of freedom. I didn't think I was going to have it. We shouldn't be anomalies. It shouldn't be, oh, you're a formerly incarcerated attorney. How interesting, how great. Let it be inspiring, but let it become the norm. To get out of that box that society's placed you in. And when I say box, I'm not talking about the prison cell. I'm talking about that psychological, spiritual, mental block that all of us went through at some point in our life and gave up hope about having something better. Hearing these people's stories, they all have come from similar circumstances that I have come from. Man, some beautiful things can happen when you just believe in people and give them tools and resources. And that's really what the movement work is about. How do we move the needle? How do we change people's ideas about who formerly incarcerated people are? We got some work to do, and you all are equipped to do it. Three weeks on this RV, we can help change the narrative. It's an opportunity to really be true and real with one another. Be human, be free.
Well, if you... If you like that five minute clip, you should see the whole video. Um, I've had the opportunity to really watch, maybe not all of the road trip documented uh, 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 films, but over the course of the last, certainly over the course of the last eight years, I've seen most of them. And this one for me at least was the most, the most powerful. Before I introduce um, the panel, let me just briefly, Mike kind of mentioned Strata's interest in this. Strata's mission is to better connect education and work for the most people possible in the country. Currently, we still have 11 million unfilled jobs in this country, and so um, we are, we're very interested in finding talent wherever we can find it and to tap every possible resource. And obviously, the, the um, population that we're talking about here um, is, is a population that we should be, we should be working with. Uh, um, and with respect to narrative change, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the panel first, then we can talk about uh, um, the importance of narrative change. So um, we have to my uh, immediate right, Jenna from the Just Trust. The Just Trust is one of the, the, the sponsors of, um, of this particular road trip. Uh, we have Carrie from SHRM uh, that sponsored all of the research, or I should say conducted all of the research along with, uh, along with Strata. We're a very data intensive place at Strata. And the good news is uh, we have some very strong research that Carrie can, uh, um, Carrie can share. And then last but not least, you saw you saw Ken on the, on the screen, but um, Ken Oliver with Checker. So um, why don't we start first with Jenna? So, um, you know, the prior panel talked about the power of storytelling, which is also one of the reasons that we're so interested in Road Trip Nation. But sort of a subset of storytelling is narrative change. So can you talk a little bit about why narrative change is so important to the Dress Trust and particularly the work on this project? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, the For those who don't know, the Just Trust is a philanthropic group that um, works to advance criminal justice reform in the United States, and specifically to build a much smaller, more humane, people-centered engine of justice and safety in this country. And um, so much of our work focuses on powering advocacy ecosystems, but it's not a new thing to understand that we can't just change all of the harmful laws um, and expect everything within the system to be different. We also have to confront and grapple with the culture that exists around an issue if we wanna make really systemic changes to it. Um, and so we have known since day one that investing in narrative and storytelling was going to be absolutely critical to the story of criminal justice reform. Um, and when you think about um, the way that, when you think about the, the system of criminal justice in this country right now, we are not here as the world's top incarcerator just because we have a lot of laws that criminalize a lot of things, which we do. We are here because for the last 50 plus years, we have been telling stories um, in our TV and podcasts and films and books and oral tradition that have created these really dominant cultural narratives around what keeps us safe, um, who should be punished, and with what level of force. Um, and these, these narratives have created kind of a cultural consciousness um, that really marries us to the status quo and often gives us permission to double down on it. So just in the way that storytelling played a really important role in getting us here today, storytelling has to essentially play a role in creating new solutions. And that's why we supported this film with our partners um, at Stand Together, this Road Trip Nation film, because they set out to tell a really different story around what it means to be impacted by the justice system in America. Um, it, a story that really centers people and hope and dignity and doesn't just look at what did somebody do, which is how we're used to being oriented to the criminal justice system, um, but what people can do. And that, that shift is really powerful and, and Road Trip Nation does such a great job of creating stuff that is sometimes complex and hard to grapple with and making it really, really accessible to people of all different backgrounds and ideologies and political affiliations. So um, 
I just think that if we can continuously tell stories like this relentlessly and for a very long time, we can actually begin to chip away at some of that stigma that has created by those dominant narratives I was talking about and start to create um, a culture of community embrace. Because frankly, the vast, vast, vast majority of everyone who's incarcerated in prison and jail today will come home. And by excluding individuals from the job market and from the housing market and all the things that we know are important to, for anyone to be successful, not just people who are impacted by the justice system, um, we're not only like pre preventing people from reaching their full potential, we're really squandering opportunity and innovation in this country. Like you mentioned all those jobs that are open. We need to think more creatively about how to find solutions to that and to these challenges that we're in in our current moment with the justice system. Well, that's great, thank you. Um, Carrie, with respect to the, the research, and we partnered with you on the research, which was, which was terrific. And just to, just to um, clarify for the audience, um, the type of research and data collection we did was both on um, both on the documentary that you just saw a clip of, but then we also provided content, um, kind of wraparound content, if you will, so that for other justice-impacted individuals, there were, what, only three folks who went on the road trip. Um, uh, so in terms of making that content kind of as sticky as possible, we provided additional content so that if, um, you know, you had been in the criminal justice system previously and you were looking at, you know, trying to, um, um, you know, what types of occupations would be open uh, to me, looking at additional content, uh, we provided that, or I should say road trip, uh, provided that content as well. So, um, and we looked at, well, I'll let Carrie describe kind of who we, who we looked at and what that research looks like, but I was really impressed at least because um, just knowing some of the results from the prior road trips, the, 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 um, the, the, the quality and the rigor and the, the impactfulness of this road trip was really, really strong. So do you wanna explain kind of sort of what the results were and who we looked at and yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll say, uh, to Tom's point about what we did with the research, we um, uh, showed this film to two different groups, so HR um, professionals, employers, and then also formerly incarcerated individuals themselves, and really wanted to understand whether these resources could help with that narrative change, right, that shift of mindset on the employer side of the value that these individuals can bring to the workplace, the unique skill sets that they have, and then on the side of these individuals themselves, helping them become aware of the resources available to them as they re-enter the workforce, as they re-enter society, um, and that those things are there for them if they need. And so I'll speak a little bit to um, some of the really cool and interesting findings we found from the research. And you know, I'll start with the employer side and then speak to um, our formerly incarcerated sample as well. On the employer side, one um, one thing we really wanted to test the temperature of is, you know, what's the buy-in right now, and can we use these resources to shift to the narrative? And something that I think was, you know, really heartwarming to begin with is, you know, we started out saying, what's this going to look like? And actually, a large majority of our HR professional audience who we screened this film to was pretty open to the idea of hiring these individuals, of hiring, of, of engaging in second chance hiring, um, which I think is really neat. Um, there are already advocates out there uh, for this type of hiring. It's really the barriers that come afterward, I think, that we saw in the research that, you know, we really need to make progress with. So, for example, getting that executive level buy-in, getting that people, people manager buy-in, those individuals who are going to be working with these people every day in the office, shaping the culture. Um, and so, so in, in terms of the film, I think one of the, the top takeaways we heard from this employer audience was this recognition that um, we're all human and we all make mistakes. Um, but sometimes that learning from those mistakes is just more visible to the watching world um, than the you know mistakes we might make 
every day in our lives. And so um, I thought that was really cool that that was something that resonated the most with these employers is it wasn't necessarily that they were remembering specific stories. We followed up with this group three months later and the thing that they still remembered from the film was how it made them feel, right? How it made them feel and this idea that we're all connected, we're all human. Don't judge a book by its cover. We have We all have our own journeys and be open to that. And the, you know, unique impact then that those stories can have on what we can bring to the workplace. Um, so I thought that was really neat. And then to the second piece of establishing that buy-in, buy we had the chance to sit down actually with some of these HR professionals one-on-one -on -one interviews and asking them, you know, what's happening in your organization? How can we make more of a success here with the second chance hiring? And, um, you know, one of the participants said it really well, I think. She was a CHRO, a Chief Human Resources Officer, and said when she's trying to get buy-in from her, her executive team, her C-suite, what they're often looking for are data-backed success stories. And I think that's what we really have from this research is the data to show that this is successful and the stories to make that connection, that relation, um, to really show um, the, the power and the benefit um, to engaging in this type of hiring. Um, and then on the the flip side, we're, we're working on wrapping up our research with these formerly incarcerated individuals that we've also followed initially, you know, screening this film to them and then following up with them three months later to get a sense of how has it impacted them, has, how has it shaped their views. Um, and something that is really cool that I think a lot of us have been excited about is um, in this three-month follow-up, we've found that of the um, formerly incarcerated individuals we screened the film to, three months later, 92% said they took an action or considered taking an action to advance their career, whether that be reaching out to a mentor, um, asking for career advice, looking, um, you know, in exploring career options they didn't think was previously open to them. And about three in four, so about 75% credited the resources, um, the, the film um, and this website hub that we shared with them to encouraging them to take and to motivate that action, um, which I think is really incredible, really powerful stuff. And the next phase, we're gonna be sitting down with some of these individuals one-on-one, -on -one, conducting interviews to a little bit more, learn a little bit more about their stories um, and what those next steps can be for the research. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it was a very detailed research. Carrie did an excellent job of distilling it very succinctly. So, um, so Ken, um, we saw you on the on the video, and I had the opportunity because I hadn't seen the documentary in a couple of months. So I rewatched it last night in my hotel room, and I was struck by something that I was struck by the first time I saw it, which was the comment that you made, and it was very meaningful to me because we all have our, 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 our challenges in life, some more than others, but your, your comment about how don't let your circumstances define you, define your circumstances. So can you, can you explain a little bit about what that means to you and, and, and how you conveyed that to the road trippers on the, on the trip? Sure. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is I, I knew at least two thirds of those road trippers um, before the Road Trip Nation was filmed. I was incarcerated with Hugo um, at Soledad State Prison. Um, and so really know a lot about his story and who he is and um, also knew London ahead of time, worked with London um, at a public interest law firm. And so um, we've had the, I've had the privilege of having a lot of conversations with them individually about what it means to be formerly incarcerated, what it means to reenter in, in the community. And so, you know, one of the things that most people who are on the pathway to incarceration who have been incarcerated, they've been limited by um, limiting beliefs, usually coming from external sources, whether it be schools, um, a broken home, parents, relatives, et cetera. There's traumas that happen long before people get on the pathway to incarceration. And what happens is, is what we get formed and shaped by those external circumstances that affect us in our life. I think probably everyone in this room can imagine an external circumstance that they had between one year old and 15 or 18 years old that define their life or, or plays an important factor in their life. And so usually those things that affect people in prison are negative. 
meaning that they've been some kind of negative thing they told about what they can do and what they can't do or who they are as a human being. They thought that maybe their only recourse was to hang out in the streets or to use substances with their friends or that they didn't have an opportunity to pursue a career or education, for example. And in my own life, when I went to prison, I remember thinking to myself that I just met a person, a judge, who didn't know me at all. I was in my mid-20s. And he gave me two life sentences, which in essence meant that I was going to die in prison. And I thought about the way that the system and this particular individual who was just doing his job, but it was, it was a very you know, narrow-sided job, if you ask me, um, how I was being defined by a system who really didn't know anything about my life story or who I was as an individual. And I remember when I got that 52-year life sentence, I went back and I thought to myself that, that I was not going to allow this sentence or this system to define what my possibilities were. I, did, I had no idea what that meant in reference to what my trajectory would be. Um, but I knew that my life, and I believe every single human being's life on this planet, is worth more than dying in a cage for 50 or 60 years. I, I just believe that inherently as a human being. Um, so I just refused to believe it. And you know, one of the things that I learned I, when I was in prison is um, how I could actually live free mentally even though my body was captured. So I spent a lot of time reading books, um, became a voracious reader. And I found a liberation in reading. I found conversations with some of the brightest minds in the world. Um, and that, that freed me. And it gave me a sense of purpose while I was in prison. Still had no idea if I was ever gonna get out of prison or be on Roadship Nation. Um, but I often remember telling my friends and telling people that I would run into, like, listen, they, they've attempted to define us by these barbed wire fences and these mini 14 armed guards that were standing in gun towers ready to shoot us at any given time. But in our own personal space, in our minds and in our spirit, we can define who we are and what we do and what our possibilities are. And so it's just something that I inherently believe and in. uh, I think that all of the road trippers are testaments to not, or breaking free from those limiting beliefs. Um, I hope that I'm an example of breaking free of those limited beliefs of what's possible for people who have made mistakes in their life or people who have come up against adverse circumstances. Um, you know, in America, we've done a very good job at like putting people in boxes. Mm -hmm. You know, we've done a very good job at othering people and defining who's worthy and who's not worthy, you know. Um, and I tell people that we should resist that notion, right? That we should define ourselves for ourselves um, and that should be limitless. Yeah. So I think Ken had a video that he wanted to show. Um, but before we do that, just one follow-up question. So I know a little bit about Checker. Checker, um, for those who may not know, provides background checks uh, you know, during the HR process when you're screening certain candidates. So it's a tool used um, to screen candidates. So I'm curious why you know, your role with Checker working for um, working for a company like that, I think most of us would think about, you know, in terms of the types of individuals that you're talking about, that, 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 um, that would be a, um, a screening mechanism. And so what, how does your work at Checker, the type of work that it does, how are you able to influence some of the, some of the processes and decisions that they make at Checker? Sure. It's a, it's a really, really complex question that you just asked. Um, because I come from the advocate community. You know, I started off in nonprofits and working for a public interest law firm that was involved with criminal justice reform. I was a policy director in California for criminal justice reform. And most of the community, rightfully so, believes that we shouldn't be doing background checks. And I think that there's an alternative perspective, whether people choose to adopt it or not. I think that when I came into the space working for a public interest law firm in the advocacy space, I was taught to not shy away from my experience in life. It would be difficult for me to do that because I spent almost 24 years in prison. Yeah. So whether I went to fill out a rental application or went to apply for a job, when there's a 24 year gap in your resume, when there's a 24 year gap in your rental history or your credit history, there's probably gonna be a question about that. 
right? Where you've been, what's happened, et cetera. And so it's a very important pivot point at, I mean, at cross section when, when you're asked that question, because do you shy, shink away and, and lie or you know, say something dishonest? Or are you hopeful that people can accept you for who you are and you're, you're transparent about your experience and how you've grown and transformed? I happen to believe in the power of transformation. I happen to believe that the problem is not with the background check, it's with the people interpreting the background check. It's like racism. It's not my fault, right? It's, it's the people who are interpreting me based on my skin color who I have an issue with. And so when it comes to background checks, like we have formed a very intolerant society and formed this notion of like this scarlet letter that is really a holdover from King's England. Civic death, civil death, excuse me. And what, I, what I'm passionate about is changing the narrative of corporate America. I'm passionate about changing the narrative of what it means to experience a criminal record in America, where we've been over-policed and you know, um, over-racialized when it comes to policing in America. And so like, I'm, I'm a firm believer in transparency. I'm, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I didn't prison. Prison shaped who I am today. It's allowed me to do this work. It's allowed a lot of privileges for me. Um, and I want to provide those same privileges for other people. So working for a background check, a lot of my friends in the space, you know, Ken, are you crazy going to work for a background check company? But I, I have a privilege, and I get to talk to CEOs across the country almost every single day. I get a chance to go to symposiums like this and, and talk to people about changing the narrative by telling stories. The video we're about to see is the kind of story that I like to tell about Larry Miller, and we'll, we'll see that, and I'll ask, we'll talk about that afterwards. But I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that if we take away the background check, right, I'm much more fearful of somebody like me going into a workplace, with Google, for example, or some other place, and then three years later, somebody Googles me and finds out that I did life in prison, and they like ring the alarm bells and be like, ah, you know, that type of thing, which is a dangerous situation. I'd much rather have somebody listen to me and have a conversation with me like the people in this room and say, Ken's not a bad guy, I wanna give him a shot. He deserves a shot, he deserves a chance to rebuild his life and, and reset and, and do things. I wanna build a society of tolerance and inclusivity. And I think that we, there's models that exemplify that path. Um, I mean, I can remember, and I'm gonna date myself here, so forgive me. <laughs> um, 30 years ago, there was no such thing as pronouns. There was no describing yourself as he, him, or she, her, or any of the things that I grew up with. And dare I say, it was quasi-taboo to have like gender differences in, in this country. And then there was this groundswell of this movement where we tried to normalize as a community and as a society gender identity. And then legislatures picked up on that. And then all of a sudden we were passing laws around same-sex marriage, et cetera. And then Supreme Courts and court systems decided to change their perspective on it. And here we are 30 years later, and, and at least in California where I'm from, and in many places that are progressive and going along the lines of society, that's it's not even a second thought anymore. And it's, it's, it's had this amazing trajectory of tolerance, inclusion, diversity of people when it comes to that particular movement. There have been others, right? My dream and my hope is that 25 years from now, it won't be a stigma in this country to have had a touch point with the criminal justice system, either arrest or conviction or whatever, and that we can normalize the pathway of people who've been justice impacted. Um, so that's why I'm a fan of transparency and why I'm not fearful of background checks. Um, I, I think it could possibly do more harm than good when people are like snooping around, digging around, doing all kinds of stuff to find out stuff about people and, and creating a different type of space that I think will be unhealthy in the long run. I wanna be sensitive to time. So do you wanna preview the video and then we can sure. show it? So you know, speaking of transparency, I think Larry Miller um, story exemplifies why it's important for us to be transparent. Um, I, I think this is probably a great segue into the video and then maybe afterwards I can just touch a little bit on Larry's uh, story and why it's important. Transparency is important if, if you don't mind that. Coming out of college with a four year accounting degree, my expectation was that I was gonna have the same opportunities as anyone else. I realized early on that if people knew about my background in the criminal justice system, that I wasn't going to get the opportunities that everyone else was getting. My name is Larry Miller. I'm the chairman of the advisory board for the Jordan brand at Nike. From the age of 
12, 13 up to 30, I was in and out of jail. When I was 16 years old, I was arrested for a gang-related homicide. I was charged as an adult. Then inside the prison, I got my associate's degree and graduated from Temple University with a bachelor's in accounting. Coming out of college, I spent the whole day interviewing with a number of people. And finally, I got to the last person, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna share my background with this guy. He reached in his pocket and pulled down an envelope, and he said, I had an offer letter here all ready to give you, but I can't give it to you now. I just can't take the chance. From that point on, I decided I was not gonna share my background. I wasn't gonna deny it, but I wasn't gonna volunteer the information. And that's how I approached my career. But it's hard to keep things quiet and hidden. I was nervous and worried and having nightmares and headaches because I'm worried that it's gonna come out. But to me, that's all the more reason why fair chance hiring is much more important because I wouldn't have had to hide from my past. And I think that would have made a major difference for me. Fair chance hiring not only benefits the people who receive the jobs, but it's gonna benefit the companies that are involved in it as well. Some of the most creative, intelligent people I ever met were people that I met and connected with when I was incarcerated. I think there's an incredible resource there that can be tapped into. If we can get folks proper employment, the opportunity to build careers, to afford a mortgage, and all these things, I think to me, that has a major positive impact on society. It sounded like there was something else you wanted to share about that video. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we were speaking about transparency and, you know, I, I have the extreme honor and privilege to be a, a personal friend of Larry's. He's my mentor. Um, and he spent a lot of time talking to me about the stress and the personal health consequences that he suffered as a result of living with this secret for 40 years. I mean, th this, this guy did 10 years in prison, had an amazing career trajectory, ended up, you know, being best friends with Michael Jordan and, and Mark Cuban and all types of people. He became a, um, the president of the Portland Trail Blazers and had an amazing career at Nike. Um, he's still there, by the way. And he kept that a secret for 40 years because the very first company, Arthur Anderson, um, I can say that because they're out of business now. Um, <laughs> actually, when Larry decided to be transparent, told him that he wasn't going to offer him the job, he took the check and the letter away and said, because you have a conviction history, because you were in prison, I don't think that you're worthy. And shame on Arthur Anderson for They're missing, lost, out, miss, yeah, like. missing out on, on, <laughs> on a guy who took the Jordan brand from $140 million to $4 billion in four years. And so I like to share Larry's story and talk about Larry because it's important, just as he mentioned, that we normalize the other side of this argument, and that's society. The issue isn't with Larry. The issue isn't with me. The issue is how you're perceiving me, and that's a personal choice. And a lot of that is based on ignorance. It's based on those narratives that were spoken about um, earlier by Jenna so eloquently. Um, we need to change those narratives and through effective storytelling, showing examples of people who are doing amazingly successful things, or what's, and especially what's possible, that we're just like anybody else. You know, we made a poor choice, like everyone's made a poor choice um, in their life, um, that we have a contribution to make to society, to our families, to the community, to the economy, just like anybody else, no different. So one question for the panel would be, and I'm kind of improvising here, but one question for the panel would be, um, I think we've all been super impressed with, and um, this road trip kind of, certainly speaking for, from, from Strata's perspective, exceeded what our expectations was for it. So what, what do you all think ought to be the next step? You know, we've talked about potentially doing another road trip focused um, on criminal justice reform and justice impacted individuals. What, what, what do we take from what we learned with this particular experience in terms of another, another engagement? Um, what, what might that look like, do you think? Feel free to join in. Um. We actually are already making plans <laughs> around that. Uh, I, I think that this film is actually quite 
timeless and has a lot more to do than it's already done. And so we're talking to Road Trip Nation right now about how do we take this thing on, on the road again and um, start to have conversations with lawmakers across the country and educational institutions and companies and, and carry the message that was so beautifully crafted through this very accessible film and find ways to extend the, the opportunity for conversation in a lot more places. Um, I, I think for me, um, for the employer audience, we're also doing a little bit of this ourselves as well, um, t knowing that one of the big things that came out of the research was this need to tailor resources more to these different audiences, especially, again, the executive audience that I mentioned that you know, our um, respondents were very adamant about saying, when you get that executive buy-in, more other people are gonna buy in. Um, and so uh, actually today, we also had um, an individual from the SHRM research team share this research with our uh, executive network, um, which is a group of HR executives and above all the way up to CHRO, um, shared some of the initial findings of the research with them and had a conversation. Um, it's a, a space where they can talk about the challenges there they're facing in their organization? How do they make this happen? Um, and so I think one of the, the next big steps, at least in the employer community, is you know to, to, to start talking and share these stories um, and share it in a way that resonates most with each of these audiences. I, I would add on that. Thank you both for that. Um, first, understand patience. This is a marathon, not a sprint. We, we are very much in our embryonic stage in this movement when it comes to workforce development in this country and the future of work and how we remove or, or help dissipate that scarlet letter that attaches. It took us a couple hundred years to build that up. It's going to take us probably a long, hopefully not as long, but it's going to take us a long time to build that, uh, erase that. I think we all have a role to play, the people that are at this conference. I think there's basically three flywheels that kind of have to work at the same time, and they've been alluded to here um, just a second ago. But the very first one is education providers and how do we focus on reskilling and upskilling so people can compete. The prison system is inadequately, um, woefully inadequate at providing skills that translate to the market for a whole lot of different reasons. But education in the form of the Pell Grant stuff that's happening, that's a great piece of it. But Realizing also the audience, 90% of people who are in prison aren't going to touch a college campus. And so how do we get people the skills necessary to compete in the workforce? That's the first flywheel that has to work. The other flywheel that has to work is how do we get inside of the executives, um, the E-suites and C-suites uh, for change management and D&I um, um, changes to happen inside corporate America to receive the talent once they're skilled up. And then the kind of third flywheel that's responsible or should be responsible for undergirding kind of both of those first two is policy. How do we work with federal and state policymakers and local policymakers to support businesses, right, and public-private partnerships to expand the way that they view the workforce? And then also how do we fund, it's expensive, education is expensive, right? How do we fund and provide resources to support talent getting skilled up? And so when we can get a kind of all three of those things working together at the same time, we can really make some traction not only in the short term, but in the long term to change the trajectory of uh, justice impacted folks in the workforce. Okay, so I lied, last question, before I get the hook, which is, um, Ken said something that I think was really important, which is that um, fear generally comes from ignorance, um, and you're either, um, you may not know someone, who's been just as impacted or incarcerated. And I'm thinking from the perspective of an executive, somebody who hires people, because the research showed that the real effort needs to be made with people on the front lines in the C-suite and other executives hiring. So, and these are people who don't like to think, I'm an executive, and I really don't like to think of myself as being ignorant. So how do you, how do you think about, and this is really for the whole panel, how do we think about um, working with the executive tier about increasing their willingness and openness when, you know, they've never walked, you know, a lot of them have never walked a mile in these shoes, right? And, and how do you think about sort of change management and trying to, um, you know, change mindsets and narrative change? And I mean, 
this is important, but what, what beyond this can we do to help open minds and open hearts to, to thinking differently about who and how we hire? I'll take it for an initial stab. So I think, you know, when you look around the ecosystem of, of corporate America, usually what happens when a CEO decides to implement something is considered radical as, as fair chance hiring programs is because that CEO or person has a touch point. So like if you look at Stuart Butterfield from Slack, he goes into San Quentin, he meets three or four Hugos, people like that, and he's moved. And he decides that he wants to do something about the problem and he comes back to Slack and then he speaks and then everybody else, it cascades down and everybody yeah. else listens. Same thing with Daniel at Checker, he goes into San Quentin in 2015 and moves him, right? Um, Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, had a father that was in prison, it became passionate to push the first step back. There's very different ways that motivate decision makers to get involved. Um, Jamie Dimon, 10% of their workforce is people that have been justified with records for the last three years, which is an amazing, 4,300 people, right? And you know, speaking, I was at a conference at Columbia last week and they, you said when Jamie Dimon speaks, like everyone scrambles to go do and make that happen. So it really has to come from executive leadership, which is why you know, I'm in so many conversations and, and implore us all to have more conversations with C-suite folks about this problem. There's a lot of ways to get them involved. Some is taking people into prison. Some is creating films or documentaries where you're showing what other leaders are doing in the space. It, it's very powerful when you have somebody like Jamie Dimon who's invested in this space or Stuart Butterfield, a tech company who's invested in this space. The more of those stories we can show from people who look like them, the people we're talking to, the more people are willing to do it. That's where you get the curiosity up. So doing what we're doing, storytelling, conferences, corporate coalitions, like uh, the Second Chance Business Coalition and others, are all ways and different levers that we can pull and need to continue to pull uh, more aggressively to, to get the buy-in needed to cascade that down into the business and open up programs for folks. Right. So I don't think I was a very good moderator because I didn't adhere to time, but I think that was a very, uh, oh. I didn't mean to take over. it's a great panel. So thanks very much. Um, and we saved the best for last, I think. So have a great afternoon. Thanks.